And uh, well, I'll just, he, he can start. All right. Thank you, Akhil, and thank you all. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, yeah, hi, um, I'm Akhil Matthew. Um, I will, I guess yeah, maybe I, I will put my email in the, um, um, uh, in the in the in the chat. Um, so yeah, so I will be um, lecturing for the first half uh, of this undergraduate summer school, uh, and then Dustin Clausen will um, uh, will lecture for the second half. Um, so yeah, I think the I mean maybe just a few words about the format. I think in general I will try to end a few minutes before the hour. I mean, so you're encouraged to ask questions in general, but I try to hang, um, try to end a few minutes earlier uh, towards the end. So, um, you know, so if you want to sort of chat informally, um, and I also try to um, also try to drop in at uh, at the office hours and in Sokoko and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I think also I will. Um, so, so there will be some sort of exercises, um, and these are these are supposed to be, uh, I guess, sort of vistas. Uh, things to to think about to explore further, um, and um, so so I think these will also be posted probably in um, in Sokoko as well, um, and they're yeah I mean they're, they're they're supposed to be sort of food for thought and things to think about and maybe to discuss at the TA sessions. Um, also, want to encourage everyone to to go to the the TA sessions, um, and um, um, yeah I think that's about all I have to say um, for, for the introduction. And I yeah, look forward to, 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 to meeting many of you, um, you know, throughout these um, three weeks. Okay, so maybe I will start with the, the math. So we'll um, share the screen. So, okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so hopefully everyone can, um, can see this. Um, yeah, so, so essentially this is, um, this is going to be a, um, I mean, this is gonna be a mini course around the, uh, the algebra and the arithmetic uh, of quadratic forms. Um, so we're gonna cover some, some different aspects, um, some of which are more sort of general and field theoretic and some, especially the second half of the course will be uh, more so specific to the rational numbers and about, uh, you know, sort of connections to number theory. Um, but yeah, so I, I just want to start, so, so today's lecture to be sort of an introduction to um, two quadratic forms. And I, I, I thought I would start by, by mentioning some sort of classical results that maybe sort of started this area. So quadratic forms, I mean, it's about, somehow it's about sums of squares. Um, and so, for example, there's this following, um, it's a very classical result. So theorem of Lagrange, Um, sorry, maybe I will make this a little smart. Um, and so it states that every, any positive integer is a sum of four squares. So, sorry, so this is about squares in, in the integers. Um, so we're gonna be talking about squares in, in general fields, but, but um, I think maybe this started with squares and the integers. Um, and then there's a theorem of Legendre, uh, which states when, when an integer is a sum of three squares, and it states the following. So a positive integer, uh, and so let me, let me first assume it's not divisible by four. Not divisible by four is a sum of three squares, if and only if it's not congruent to minus one mod eight. Minus one or seven uh, modulo eight. Um, uh, and then there's the theorem of uh, Fermat, uh, which is about sums of two squares. And this states that a positive integer is a sum of two squares. Uh, if and only if any prime factor that, uh, well, so let me write it this way. So 
any prime factor, uh, which is congruent to three mod four, uh, occurs with even multiplicity. So there's sort of a complete classification of, uh, uh, you know, is it, yeah, sorry. So I guess I should say in Legendre theorem, if, if you have something which is divisible by four and you want to know if it's a sum of three squares, then first you just divide it by as many factors of four. Well, you write it as a power of four times something which is not divisible by four. And then you apply this criterion to the, 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 the part that's not divisible by four. Um, so with these three theorems, just in sort of a complete classification of when you can write an integer as a sum of, well, however many number of squares that, that you want. Um, yeah, so these are sort of three classical results in um, sort of elementary number theory. Um, and I also want to mention another result sort of in this vein, which is not over the integers, but involving rational functions. Um, so this is a theorem. This is a theorem of Artin. And actually it was a, it was a Hilbert problem. Uh, and it states the following. So, so let f be a rational function. Uh, so rational function over the real numbers in many variables, let's say in n variables. Uh, and then the theorem is that f is a sum of squares of rational functions. So it's a sum of squares in the field, let's say r rational functions and n variables, if and only if it takes non-negative values wherever it's defined. So, right. Um, and so in fact, you can sort of make this quantitative. So it's a further refinement, which is due to Pfister that you only need two to the n squares. Now, it's not actually known if this is best possible, but you can always um, write something as a sum of two to the n squares. So yeah, so all of these results, I mean, somehow they're saying that, you know, you wanna write something as a sum of squares and then there are various sort of um, obstructions that you might, you know, you might naturally try to write down. So, so for example, in Legendre's theorem, I mean, it's basically some congruence condition that you can see if you have a sum of three squares, then um, you know this congruence can't happen. And or if you have a sum of you know, sum of squares over the rational numbers, uh, sorry, over the real numbers, it has to be non-negative. And basically, these results are saying that those are somehow the only um, only obstructions. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So these, yeah. Sorry, question. Does that say two to the n squares needed? Uh, yeah, so, well, let me, let me say it. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't the best way of saying it. So F is a sum of, in fact, two to the N squares. Uh, it's actually an open problem. What is the best, you know, what is the best, what is the best bound here? Okay, so, um, so these are just some sort of general results in, you know, sort of in this area, but now we wanna sort of be more systematic about like what a quadratic form is and what are the types of questions we wanna ask. Um, okay, so, so let F be a field. And I guess throughout, I'm gonna assume that the characteristic is not two. Um, and basically what we're gonna be considering is, is the following. So let me call this a pre-definition. Um, so a quadratic form uh, over F is a function Q, which goes from F to the N to F, uh, which is of the form Q of, well, let's say some vector uh, X is a sum of some matrix coefficients AIJ times XI XJ. Uh, so for example, it could just be X one squared plus dot 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 plus X N squared. I mean, that was the kind of thing that we were uh, thinking about just a, just a minute ago. Um, so this is really a pre-definition. So, so this is basically about a quadratic form um, supposed to be, um, but I'm calling this a pre-definition because we don't, so, so this definition is not really taking into account the following sort of basic phenomenon, which is that we can change variables. You know, so we can make some linear change of variables over f to the n, and that will give us a different function, but we should sort of, sort of think of that as being the same quadratic form, and it's sort of encoding the same information. Um, so, 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 so now let me make a sort of more formal definition. Uh, so definition, so let v be a finite dimensional vector space, 
uh, over f. So a symmetric bilinear form uh, on v uh, is a function b from b cross v into, uh, into f, uh, such that the following conditions are satisfied. So, uh, so first of all, b is bilinear meaning it's linear in each variable if you fix the other variable. So i.e. b of an argument comma v and b of b comma the argument are linear for each vector. So if you fix one variable, it's, it's linear in the other. Uh, and b is symmetric. So b of b comma w is b of w comma v. So this is something like an inner product, uh, for example, an inner product on, on r to the n. The usual inner product on r to the n. And uh, right. So we're going to be what we're going to be interested in is not sort of arbitrary symmetric bilinear forms, but ones which are non-degenerate. So sorry, so maybe I should actually turn it this way. Maybe this is better, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll say that B is non-degenerate or an inner product if, uh, for all vectors v and v such that v is not zero, then there exists another vector w such that b of v comma w is not zero. Um, so equivalently, uh, this means that, well, so in general, if you have a bilinear form, it gives you a map from v to, to v dual. Um, and then the condition is that this map should be an isomorphism. Um, and so in general, we're going to say that an inner product space uh, is a vector space with an inner product. And just as a matter of uh, sort of just as a matter of notation, I'm going to often denote the inner product like the dot product. So, when we're sort of writing as B as a linear form, but also um, I'll just use the standard uh, dot product notation. Okay, so this is the notion of an inner product space. Um, so it could be a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. And so what does a non so 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 what does an inner product space look like? Well, let's say we choose a basis of a vector space. So 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 let E1 through En be a basis uh, for the vector space V. Um, and so if we have an inner product, um, so then we obtain, uh, well, we obtain an n by n symmetric matrix which I'll write as Aij and this is given as Ei dotted with Ej. Um, and so conversely, the symmetric matrix uh, is going to determine the inner product by bilinearity. Um, and also note that, right, so this is an n by n symmetric matrix, um, but it has one other condition, which is that it has to be non singular, it has to have a non zero determinant. Uh, because we're assuming that the um, that it's an inner product space that it's it's bilinear, so non-degeneracy gives that uh, this matrix Aij is non-singular, and so the conclusion of this example is that if you if you fix the basis of your vector space, then to, to give it the structure of an inner product space is exactly the same as giving uh, an n by n non-singular symmetric matrix. So. So for a fixed basis, an inner product is just the same thing as an 
and by n, non-singular symmetric base, uh, symmetric matrix. Okay, so, right. So I started by talking about quadratic forms and then I switched to talking about inner product spaces. So, so what's the connection? Um, so if we're given an inner product space, Uh, so then we can also define a function. So let's let's call it V and let's give it the dot product notation. So then what we can do is we can define a function Q of X or Q from V to um, uh, the, the, the ground field uh, ground field F by Q of Q of little V is V dot V. So this is called the associated quadratic form. And it's called the, it's called, right. So this is, this is called a quadratic form. And basically if you write everything out in coordinates, this is gonna have exactly the same form that was, um, that was written down earlier. So, so, I mean, so we said that a quadratic form is something like, um, well, something like this over here, it's some function of this form. And uh, that's exactly the form that this Q, Q um, function is gonna have. So it has the form in a basis. So this function Q um, actually determines B. So, uh, or sorry, I'm not calling it B now, I'm calling it a dot product. Um, so note that the inner product is determined by Q because X dotted with Y is one half of uh, Q of X plus Y minus Q of X minus Q of Y. So you have the polarization. Um, you can recover the dot product from the, um, from the quadratic, um, quadratic form. So I think I'm going to interchangeably use the, the words quadratic space and inner product space. because these are equivalent data. Okay, so, so this is our definition. And now let's ask some sort of basic questions about a, um, about a quadratic space or about an inner product space. So what are some of the basic questions that we can ask uh, if, we're, if we're given one of these, um, these data? So the first question that we can ask is when are two when are two inner product spaces or quadratic spaces isomorphic? This is going to be one of the basic questions we're going to be interested in. Uh, and so, what is an isomorphism here? An isomorphism means so an isomorphism between quadratic spaces is a linear isomorphism, uh, which preserves the quadratic form, so which preserves the dot product. So we, we want some tools for being able to, to figure out whether if, you know, if someone hands you two, two quadratic spaces, how can we tell whether they're isomorphic? Um, the next question is, so if we're given a quadratic space, when is there a vector of zero length? So given V, so when is there a vector uh, which has length zero, meaning V dot V is equal to zero? Well, I guess I should say V is not zero. V is not the zero vector, but it, it has length zero, V dot V is equal to zero. Um, so such a, such a vector is called an isotropic vector and such a inner product space is called uh, isotropic. So And so in fact, one of the basic questions in this theory that you want to ask is, is when is a quadratic space isotropic? When can you find a non-zero vector of um, um, a zero length? Um, okay, and the third question is, which elements do occur as lengths, or maybe I should say length squared. So which elements 
uh, um, of the of the of the base field F, so which elements occur as v dot b for various vectors v not equal to zero. And so this is kind of this is some sort of generalization of you know if you're this is some sort of generalization. This in particular includes the question of like when is when is an element your field of your field a sum of n many squares because you're um, your quadratic form could be x1 squared plus dot 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 plus x1 squared. Okay. So one of the goal, one of the goals of this, this mini course is that we want to answer all of these questions when f is irrational numbers. Uh, and that's given by the Hassel-Minkowski theorem, which is going to be one of the results that's proved in this course. Um, right. So maybe I should say something about why um, you know why we're think why we're interested in quadratic forms in particular, um, and not say cubic forms or quartic forms. Uh, why why quadratic forms are special? Um, and in fact, these questions, all of these questions. Uh, are much more difficult uh, for higher degree forms. So quadratic forms are they're somehow special in that there is a there is a very rich theory of them that you can actually answer all these questions in many cases, uh, but also you get interesting answers. Um, whereas it's much harder to say sort of interesting things and or interesting sort of very general things in 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 higher degrees. So, so what is sort of special about quadratic forms that, that leads to this, this theory? I mean, I think there are probably there are many reasons for this, but at least two particularly salient reasons, um, which, um, well, which lead into the next topics in this course, uh, those sort are of special to quadratic forms. Well, first is that quadratic forms have tons of symmetry. I mean, so this is the theory of the orthogonal group. Whereas higher degree forms generally don't have as much symmetry. And so, for example, as we'll see, quadratic forms, there's there's only really one, there's only one isomorphism class of quadratic forms if you're over an, al over an algebraically closed field. Um, and then there are lots of symmetries. So this sort of connects like the theory of quadratic forms over a general field to somehow the arithmetic of the field, be so the size of its Galois group, and so forth. Um, Another reason is, well, sort of related reason, which I, the next thing I want to talk about is that there's this, well, quadratic forms are uh, same as these inner products and inner products give you a good notion of orthogonality. So you have this notion of orthogonality that you can really sort of, sort of run with. Okay. So I want to start by talking about orthogonality, and then we'll, we'll come back to why quadratic forms have lots of symmetries. So as usual, let's let's fix a let's fix an inner product space uh, over over the base field F. Um, and um, right. So if I have vectors v and w of my quadratic space v, they're said to be orthogonal. Uh, if v dot with w is equal to zero. Um, and so given a subspace, so given a linear subspace w sitting inside v, define the orthogonal complement w perp to be all those vectors v in, in v such that v dot w is equal to zero for all w in, in, in W. So ortho all those vectors which are orthogonal, all those vectors of V which are orthogonal to every element of W. So we'll call this is the orthogonal complement of W. And right, so, so, so what, what does this do? Well, um, you always have the basic dimension formula. So the dimension of W plus the dimension of W perp is equal to the dimension of V. That's by the non-degeneracy because we're working over a non-degenerate uh, inner, pro inner product space. 
Um, so just one caveat, I mean, if you're sort of thinking geometrically, thinking about the Euclidean inner product, the usual inner product in R to the N, uh, well then, then W perp, W plus W perp is equal to V if you're in the Euclidean setting. Uh, but that's generally not true here. So, so for example, you can have vectors that are orthogonal to themselves. Um, that's not ruled out. Um, so note that W intersect W perp is not zero in general. Uh, but, so if the inner product on V restricts to an inner, inner product, on the subspace W. So, so it's a bilinear form, so you can restrict the bilinear form and then saying that it's an inner product is saying that it's non-degenerate. So if it's non-degenerate on V, uh, then in fact, W direct sum W perp, um, well, then W and W perp are orthogonal, or sorry, they're not, they're disjoint, they're, um, um, they're linearly independent and their, their, their direct sum is, is given by um, is given by V. Um, yeah, so just, just keep in mind that you need this extra um, condition. Um, and in fact, this, let, this gives you a nice way of sort of breaking down the quadratic form or breaking down the inner product. So if you have, um, so if you have an inner product on V and it, if, you, if you choose a subspace W such that your inner product is still an inner product, so it's not degenerate, then in fact, it also restricts to an inner product on, on the complement and you get sort of a decomposition of your inner product space into W and W perp, and each of W and W perp is an inner product space itself. So this gives you a way of, of sort of breaking down an inner product space into smaller pieces. Um, and so in fact, we can just sort of formulate this as a general construction. Um, so if, if we have quadratic spaces, so, so if we have V1 and Q1, so just for simplicity, let me write this time, let me write the quadratic form instead of the inner product, though you could say this in terms of the inner product as well. So if V1 comma Q1 and V2 comma Q2, are quadratic spaces. Uh, so then what you can always do is you can form the direct sum. You can form the orthogonal, the orthogonal direct sum, V1 direct sum V2, and the quadratic form is just Q1 plus Q2. Um, so, um, and so this, this forms the direct sum of quadratic spaces or inner product spaces such that V1 and V2 sit inside as subspaces and as orthogonal subspaces. So there's sort of, I guess this is like an external versus an internal direct sum. Um, and so this gives an operation on, on, if you have two quadratic spaces, you can, you can form their external direct sum and you, you add the, the quadratic forms or equivalently you sort of define, add the inner products in such a way that they're orthogonal. Um, and so this gives you a way of building up new quadratic spaces or inner product spaces from old ones. Um, okay. So I guess you could, I could say this is the external direct sum. Okay. So this turns out to be a really useful procedure. Um, the fact that you can you can break up a quadratic space into um, into or you can build up quadratic spaces as these orthogonal direct sums of smaller subspaces, um, and it's particularly useful because in fact it's uh, it's sort of a basic uh, observation that you can always break up any quadratic space into one-dimensional subspaces. So in fact, the building blocks of quadratic spaces. If you use this procedure for building quadratic spaces from new ones, then you can actually build everything from the one-dimensional ones. And this is, well, this is called diagonalization. So, um, 
So just notation. So given an element A in F cross, we're gonna write uh, angle brackets A as the one dimensional quadratic form, or the one dimensional inner product space. Sorry, my handwriting. <laughs> Say k, sorry, f times uh, a vector e1. And uh, let's say e1 dot e1 is given by a. So it's a times x squared, in other words, is, is our quadratic space. Um, right, and so what is this phenomenon of diagonalization? Um, it's saying that any quadratic form or any, quadra uh, let's say, any inner product space. Uh, is a, a direct sum of one dimensional one dimensional spaces brackets a for various various elements a um, of f cross. Um, so you can always break any uh, you can always break any inner product space into um, um, into a direct sum of one-dimensional spaces. Sorry. Uh, I, I have a question. So why yes. did you write E1 rather than just a random vector name? Oh, uh, well, I, I was just choosing a name for the basis element. I, oh, they have yeah, to be could, basis yeah. elements? Well, sorry, it, it's just, it's, it's a one-dimensional space. So I'm just choosing, choosing it's it's a one-dimensional space with some some vector whose, whose length is, yeah. Oh, okay. good, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. So question in the chat. Yep. So yeah, F times E1. Yeah, maybe that wasn't the best notation. I just mean it's a it's a one dimensional vector space and uh, um, it has a has a vector whose dot product with itself is equal to A. So sorry, maybe, maybe if I was confusing, maybe I should just say it's a quote unquote, it's a quadratic form, AX squared. Yeah, sorry, please, uh, please ask questions. Also, it'll be, please just ask the question because other, uh, it'll be, I may not see it and may not see you in real time. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay. so. So it's a basic fact in this theory that you can always write any inner product space as a, as a direct sum of, um, of one dimensional spaces, brackets A. Um, so another way of saying that uh, is that uh, if you have an inner product space, um, so this is called diagonalization, right? Why is this called diagonalization? So can choose a basis such that well, if you choose a basis, then an inner product is given by a symmetric matrix, a non-singular symmetric matrix. And you can choose a basis such that that symmetric matrix has diagonal form, such that the symmetric matrix of the inner product is diagonal. Okay. So what is the proof of this fact? Well, the, the proof is that you, you start, it, it's a proof by induction. So yeah, so let's give this a name. Let's call this V and dot product, which is that you choose, there's, there's, there's always at least some vector V sitting inside V such that V dot V is not zero. Um, and since V dot V is not zero, well, then what you can always do is you can say that V, the big vector space V is isomorphic to uh, the scalar multiples of the vector V direct some its orthogonal complement. Well, that's because V dot V is not zero. So you couldn't do this if you had a, a vector which was isotropic. Um, and so you get an inner, a decomposition of the inner product space. Um, and then you continue by induction. So, so here you've written your, your inner product space as something one dimensional plus something n minus one dimensional, and then you continue by induction.
Okay, so this is this is the this is the process of diagonalization uh, of quadratic forms. Um, so yeah, so in particular, it's saying any quadratic form. So you know, it, it, right? So in, in any quadratic form is specified by some symmetric matrix. But if you have a quadratic form, you can always write it as a diagonal form. So you can you can always write any quadratic form as uh, right. So you can always write this as isomorphic to brackets A1 plus brackets A2 plus dot 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 plus brackets AN for some AI that belong to uh, F cross um, by this diagonalization theorem. Um, but there's there's definitely no uniqueness in how you can do this. And so so I guess the the question is, you know, a lot of the question is if you if you have two such quadratic forms, you can always put it in a diagonal form, but it's not obvious that. It's not so obvious if you have two things in diagonal form when they're actually isomorphic. Um, and if there's a nice way to see that they're isomorphic. Akil, a uh, quick question. Does the fact that F has characteristic not to play a role? Um, yes, thanks. Yeah, so I'm assuming that, right. So I'm assuming the field has characteristic not to because if you're in characteristic two, um, sorry, so let me go back to, that I had written earlier. So, uh, right. So, if you're in characteristic two, so there's a theory of quadratic forms in characteristic two, but they're sort of different. Well, they're at least different. They're different. They're multiple theories of quadratic forms in characteristic two, because in characteristic not two, um, the inner product and the quadratic form are the same data because of uh, because of polarization. But polarization involves dividing by two. So if, if you're in characteristic two, the quadratic form and the bilinear form are not the, not the same thing. But you still have diagonalization, is what uh, you're saying, or not? I think, you, I think you do not still have diagonalization in general, yeah. Well, maybe it depends on, it might depend on which, which type of, <laughs> no, I think you do not have diagonalization in general. Uh, let me get back to you on that. Sorry. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks for that question. But um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess for, I'm, I'm mostly going to work in. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. So so right. So these are not unique. Um, right. So what's the simplest way in which they're not unique? Well, you can always. I mean, you can always rescale your basis. I mean, so the simplest way in which this is not unique is that you can rescale your basis. And that means you, um, you know, so that means that you, you you rescale these AIs by by some squares in your field. So uh, so let me just say that right. So these are not unique. Um, so for example, brackets A one. So sorry. So I'm just going to instead of writing it as a direct sum, I'm just going to write brackets A one through brackets A n. This is also isomorphic to brackets A one, say um, u one squared times uh, brackets A two u two squared dot 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 brackets a n u n squared for any u1 through u n that belong to f cross. You can always rescale by squares. Um, so that's already one way in which these are not unique, uh, but already that tells us something. So for example, we have the following corollary. So if every element of f is a square, So for example, if F is algebraically closed, um, right. So then any quadratic form, quadratic form is isomorphic to brackets one, dot, 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 brackets one. So in other words, well, informally, the quadratic form x1 squared plus dot 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 plus xn squared. Um, yeah, so if every element, element is a square, then you can always put it in. Um, yes, thank you. Yes, I think. Um, sorry, so the statement is that x squared plus xy plus y squared is not diagonalizable in characteristic two. Right. Yes. 
Um, sorry, so I think neither symmetric forms or nor quadratic forms necessarily have to be diagonal. It's like both characteristic too. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, let me come back to that or we can chat about it after um, the lecture. Okay, so another corollary of this, because you can always rescale anything by squares, is that any quadratic form over the real numbers uh, is isomorphic to brackets one to the R, direct sum brackets minus one to the S for some R comma comma s. And in fact, as a theorem, which I guess is on the, on the exercises of the theorem of Sylvester, is that r and s are uniquely determined by the quadratic form. So they're isomorphism invariant. And in general, uh, well, wait. So one defines R minus S to be this, one calls this the signature uh, of the quadratic form. And basically the invariance, if you're a quadratic form over the real numbers, the invariance of the quadratic form are given by the dimension and the signature. So if you're over the complex numbers or over any quadratically closed field set, any element is a square, then the the only invariant of a quadratic form is a dimension. But if you're over the real numbers, you have two invariants. You have the dimension and you have the signature given by the number of plus ones and the number of minus ones. Okay. So I have just a few minutes remaining today, but I wanna say something about the orthogonal group, about symmetries of quadratic forms. So definition, so given a quadratic space V comma Q, uh, one defines the orthogonal group. So O of V comma Q to be all those linear isomorphisms from V to itself, such that Q composed with F is equal to Q. So in other words, all linear isomorphisms, which preserve the, uh, preserve the inner product. So I guess you can think of it as automorphism, the automorphism group of the pair of V and the associated quadratic form. It's called the orthogonal group. Um, and right, so as I mentioned, the basic feature of quadratic forms is that they have, they have tons of symmetry. So this orthogonal group is somehow quite large. And there's a basic way in which you can, uh, you can construct uh, lots of elements of the orthogonal group. Um, so, there's, so there's a following example of, of, of lots of elements in the orthogonal group, namely reflections. So, so given a vector little v in the quadratic space or inner product space v, such that v dot v is not equal to zero, um, then you can define a map R sub V from V to V uh, by the formula that R sub V of X is given by X minus two times X dot V divided by V dot V times the vector E. So this is called the reflection uh, through the vector V and it has the property that R sub V, well, if you restrict it to, uh, yeah, sorry, let me just go back, yeah. So if, if you restrict it to the linear space spanned by V, then it's given by minus one. So it scales the vector V by minus one. But if you look at the orthogonal complement to V, then it acts as the identity. So the reflection, well, as in usual reflections in Euclidean space, it's, it's minus one on, on the vector V and it's, it's, it's the identity on the orthogonal complement. 
Um, so this, this already gives you a large supply of elements of the orthogonal group uh, O of V comma Q. And in fact, it's a theorem of uh, uh, carton dudonne so I think on the exercises, uh, this group O of V comma Q is actually generated by these reflections. Um, okay. Okay, so I think um, I think this is probably a good place to stop for today. So I'll hang around a little bit to um, to take questions and chat informally. Um, maybe you can discuss a characteristic two uh, situation. Um, and otherwise, um, I will try to post the uh, post the notes from today uh, and or the slides and uh, um, and there'll, there'll be some exercises. Um, so otherwise, hope to. Yeah, see, see you all here tomorrow. Uh, where will the notes Thanks. be posted? Um, so I will, I will try to post them in Sokoko. And um, I don't know actually if there's, well, do, if you have any suggestions on that. No, no I think that's a great idea. OK. Um, um, and then uh, the other thing is, I will head over to my office right now. Please stop by to say hello before you log off for the day. So I'll see you there. Okay. Take care. Bye. So is it better? Sorry, is it, is it better? So then should I should I also go to Sokoko or should I hang around here? Um, or? Right, you may have the questions might be about your lecture. So you may want to keep okay, these so notes. I'll stick around here. So you stay okay, here for a while. Good. And yeah. All right. But okay, I'll go thanks. to my office. Bye. OK. Bye. -bye. I'll, I'll stay here as well with with you, Aki. OK. That's so. Okay. If you unshare your screen, then yes, I can unshare my screen. temporarily. At least we can all kind of see each other. Yes. Uh huh. Great. Yes. I have a question about something that you said um, earlier. Uh -huh. You told that um, you had this quadratic form, and you you were saying that it is isomorphic to a space. And I was a little bit confused about what you meant by that, because a quadratic form is not a space, right? Yeah, maybe it was sorry. I was being a little informal. I guess when I when I say a quadratic form, I mean I mean the quadratic space. I mean the vector space together with the, either the function q on it or equivalently the function the inner product b on it. And okay. so so sorry. Maybe I should just create. Uh, oh, I can share my screen. So when I say the quadratic when I say the quadratic form like you know a x squared plus b y squared, I mean then you should think about the inner product space brackets a brackets b. Because if, if you think about what the function q is doing in coordinates, it's, it's exactly you know, ax squared plus by squared. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh. Hello. Hi. Hello, can you see me? Yes. Uh, you're in the Zoom meeting. Oh, you know? sorry. I'm... Okay, I think she was trying to go to her office. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe I kill the, the form. Yes. Um, this characteristic two thing is always bothersome. But yes. if you look at the bilinear form, whose matrix uh -huh. is given by the two by two matrix, zero, one, one, zero. Uh huh. So, that would be if you translated that directly to mm -hmm. a quadratic form, it would be two x y. Right. Um, but that's that's not, certainly not diagonalizable over z two. So maybe that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think someone put in the chat uh, x squared plus x y plus y squared or something. But again, you can't write a matrix for that mm -hmm. without having a half. <laughs> right. So yeah, thank yeah. you. That's a great that's a great example. Yeah. So yeah. So in particular, if you have a symmet if you have a symmetric, if you have a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form, then it doesn't in characteristic two, it does not have to have any elements uh, of non-zero length. So, so v dot v can always be zero if you're in characteristic two. Um, right. So actually, like if when you when you look at say quadratic or symmetric, so I guess people study like symmetric bilinear forms over the integers. Have symmetric bilinear forms over the integers, uh, which are which are non-singular, so non-degenerate over the integers, so determinant one or minus one, uh, but such that uh, x dot x is always even. 
Um, and, right. Right. Um, yeah, so you, you can say x or x is even positive in that case. It's always some, some even positive integer. Is that um, something that comes up later in, in this course, uh, forms over the integers or more just over so the So I branch? think only binary forms. So I think in, in Dustin's lectures, he's going to talk about binary forms over the integers. But uh, yeah. But I think not specifically, right? So not, not like these unimodular, like these unimodular even lattices in higher degrees. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Also, right. So in in characteristic two, one also has the definition of a um, of a quadratic form that's uh, that's different from the definition of a symmetric non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form, in that you specify the function q uh, such that this Q of X plus Y minus Q of X minus Q of Y is a, um, is a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for thanks for raising that. So, so more questions? No comments? I think we should thank Akil. <laughs> Very nice first lecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, will, I will be in my office later today after, is there a problem session today or not, Akil? Or the TAs? Maybe, maybe I can say something on that. So, hi, I'm Freddie. I'm one of the TAs. Um, the other two are at GSS things this week, so they can't make it. But um, Or at least they can't make it to this. They will be at the problem session. So that will be in mountain time. It's 3.30 to 5, I believe that's correct. Um, you should all have a Zoom link for that. But if you want to meet in Sokoko, we'll also put it in the auditorium like they did for this meeting. and. Um, so we can meet on Zoom slash Sokoko and we can organize into smaller groups as, as we see fit from there. So I, I do hope to see you all later today and this week. Thanks, Fred. Um, I, uh, oh. I have one question, it's probably silly. Early on in the lecture, you mentioned that we assume for our inner product that for any vector V, there's a vector w such that the inner product of v and w is non-zero, right? Uh, right. My, and then later you included the possibility that we may have vectors that have uh, norm zero, right? My, my immediate mm -hmm. thought is how is that possible by Cauchy-Schwartz, right? Because by, by Cauchy-Schwartz, Cauchy uh, you, you should have, if you have some vector w such that the norm of inner product of v and w is not zero, then by Cauchy-Schwartz, uh, v and w should have norm not zero. Does this have something to do with the possibility that we're not working with characteristic zero? or something like that, is that why? Well, we could be or in characteristic zero. I mean, I guess the issue is that uh, we're not working with the usual, well, we're not working over the real numbers. We're not working with the, um, okay. the usual inner product over the real numbers. I mean, so for example, the, well, right. So for instance, the example that, uh, um, uh, that Paul just suggested, so right. So this is an example that's going to come up a lot. So, um, uh, so right, so the example of, um, Okay, maybe I should share my screen again. Um, right, so the example of, uh, of zero, one, one, zero. So this is called the hyperbolic plane. And if you look at this symmetric bilinear form or quadratic form, it's, uh, I mean, even with the real numbers, I mean, it's not, it's not positive definite. Um, it's it's given by uh, I mean it's it's given by spanned by vectors e1 e2 such that e1 dot e2 is equal to one but e1 dot e1 is equal to zero and e2 dot e2 is equal to zero so if you were going to diagonalize it you could diagonalize this uh, into the form one minus one zero zero so this is like the form x squared minus y squared. And so, yeah, so naturally you're gonna have lots of elements of, uh, of norm um, of length squared equal to zero in this. 
Wait, so, uh, looking at the bottom right entry, is it not the case that we're assuming that uh, every vector has like non-negative norm? Is that not, are we not assuming that? that D dot no, we're not assuming that. Oh, okay, that, that makes sense, okay. Sorry. Right, so we're working over an arbitrary field in particular. So yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we will talk about, um, you know, I, or at least in the problem sets, we will talk about like the interaction. So in general, the theory of quadratic forms does interact with uh, the notion of orderings on the field of a field. So if you have a have a field, then there's a there's a well-defined notion of ordering on the field, such as the ordering, the usual ordering on the real numbers. Um, and if you have an ordering, then you can use that to, well, you can, you can use that to help classify quadratic forms because uh, for example, you can ask how many plus signs and how many minus signs are there. So if you have an ordering, you can use that to define a signature with respect to that ordering of any quadratic form. Okay, yeah, that, that makes yeah. sense. Thank right. you. Yeah, but so actually, yeah, so I should have, well, I, I will say more about this example um, tomorrow. Uh, but this example, I mean, this is sort of a really fundamental example of a quadratic form because it sort of looks the same over any field, this, this example of the hyperbolic plane. And um, yeah, but in particular, it's, it, it's, it's spanned by two isotropic vectors whose who's, uh, top product with themselves are zero and whose um, uh, inner product is, is one. Sorry, so... Right, so there's something in the chat. Um, yes, so I will share them in the auditorium in Sokoko um, after this meeting. Yes, yes. Uh, um, and I will. I will also send them to. Um, so I don't know if uh, there will be another space for them on PCMI, but at the very least, I will put them in Sokoko after this meeting. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna sign out. I'll, I'll be in after your problem session in my office. Um, contact me if you'd like to chat. Um, Great, see you, thanks a lot. Otherwise, see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, see you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so there's a question, R sub B. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I mean that you, you take this, this map, R sub B, this reflection that was defined and you restrict it to the, the um, you restrict it to the line through V. So it, it's, it's multiplication on by minus one on the line through V. And it's, it's one on the orthogonal complement of that. So. I have one more quick question. Uh, so when you, uh, so when, when you uh, wrote down the theorem about diagonalization, right? That if you have any quadratic form, uh, you can diagonalize it. Uh, you didn't uh, do a, say what you do if you're talking about Graham Schmidt, where you'd start with any arbitrary set of vectors uh, and right. you would start orthogonal project projecting. And I was thinking that the reason might be that in the process of doing that, you might say get vectors, when you subtract off the orthogonal projections, you might get a vector with norm zero, so you couldn't renormalize, right? Uh, is there or, or, or something along, along, along those lines? Uh, are there some sort of like, uh, I don't know, uh, is, is there some be some kind of criterion for when you could uh, say apply the Gram-Schmidt process to a set of uh, vectors or, or something along those lines? Uh, or is it just, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, sorry, I guess, yeah, I, think, I, I guess it is basically Gram-Schmidt. I mean, you start, you start with the vector, then take the orthogonal complement, then pick a vector in the orthogonal complement and take the orthogonal complement in there and then keep going inductively. Um, it's just that you need to, you, you need to always, you know, choose, at each stage choose a vector with non-zero uh, self inner product because not every vector will have that property in general. But uh, okay. I mean, so if you, if you have an inner product space, I mean, right, so the, the point is that if, if you have an inner product space, so if, since, since we're in characteristic not two, so I'll say thanks. Uh, if, if you have an inner product space in characteristic not two, uh, then you can always find a vector, a non-zero vector whose self inner product is not zero. And so you start with there and then you take the orthogonal complement and then you sort of keep going. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, so, what so I was it thinking, is basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So what I was thinking exactly is as being analogs of Graham Schmidt processes. If I give you a, a list of vectors, let's say they're linear independent, then you could find uh, an, uh, another list of vectors such that the span at each step is, is equal uh, to, to the, the the span at each step of, of the uh, of the, the first set of vectors that, that you gave me. But these this new set of vectors is orthonormal, right? Uh, okay. So I guess and, you can't do that because you might be okay. starting with a, an isotropic vector. 
Sure. Okay. But but for instance, if uh, let's suppose that all the vectors are not isotropic, would it then be possible? It seems like it may not be possible still because in the process of, of Gram Schmidt, you may uh, so you do is you subtract off certain projections, then you renormalize over and over again, right? Uh, Maybe in right. subtracting off and subtracting yes. off the projections, maybe you get something that's isotropic again. I think that's so, right, yeah. Yes. Is there any sort of nice criterion by which the, that in, in which the, that you could, process. I don't know if it's really of any interest anyway, I don't know if it's something anyone would care about, but. Uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, sorry, the, the question was if there's any sort of nice criterion when. A nice criterion. Might... I'm not sure if there's a nice criterion. Um, okay, sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, sorry, if, if you're so right. So one thing that I mean, if you're in an anisotropic space, so a space where all non zero vectors are not isotropic have non zero self dot product, then then you can do this, as, as you said. Um, but and so in general, what's going to happen is that so right, so I guess I will explain this um, next time is that whenever you have a quadratic space, you can always split off a bunch of copies of the hyperbolic plane, and the hyperbolic plane is somehow not that interesting it, you know it looks the same over any field and so forth um, and something anisotropic and that's sort of unique up to isomorphism and so then maybe if, if you have something anisotropic then what you said you know the grand, usual gram schmidt is gonna is gonna work just fine but for example if you have something hyperbolic I, yeah i don't know if there's um yeah that makes sense yeah, yeah. thank thanks. you thanks yeah. thanks for the question yeah um, sorry, yes, there's a question. Our vectors, yes, everything is finite dimensional. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I guess you can also develop some of this theory, um, or that is this theory, if you're not necessarily over a, um, a field, but over some sort of more general commutative ring as well. Um, and so some of that will come up in Dustin's um, lectures when we consider um, we consider things over the integers, sort of the rational numbers. Um, but yeah, we're going to be working with finite dimensional um, spaces. So out of curiosity, uh, is there a sort of general outline for what the plan for the three weeks is going to be? I know that the main results that were on the website. Uh, were mm -hmm. Hasse Minkowski, uh, I think the Siegel, ma uh, I think uh, quadratic reciprocity via Milner K theory, uh, and the Siegel mass formula. Are those uh, roughly going to be uh, the goals at the end of one of each of the first, each of the weeks, or I don't know? Um, uh, is there, or maybe I missed it. Maybe there was a more detailed why? plan somewhere. Uh, I mean, I guess, yeah. So I think. Um, and I think probably there'll be some adjustment uh, on the fly as well, but. Um, I think the plan is that for the most part, what I'm going to do in the first week and a half, is gonna be more about the general algebraic theory of quadratic forms. And I'm gonna do most of the ingredients of Hassan Minkowski. And then when Dustin takes over, he's going to, I guess, start by proving Hassan Minkowski. Um, and so quadratic reciprocity is also sort of gonna come out along, the, along those lines because when, when we set up sort of Milner K theory and so forth. Um, and then in most, I guess, in the bulk of his lectures would be the, the more sort of analytic stuff about binary quadratic forms um, over the integers, which I, I think will, yeah, have some, some special cases of the sequel mass formula. So I think that's, that's sort of the rough outline, but not completely, um, there'll be some adjustments on the way. That, that makes sense. Thanks again. Uh, yeah, thanks. Any more questions and comments? There is this question in the chat. I'm not sure if it's already answered, but it's from Rachel. Oh, oh sorry. Yes, I did not see. Um, right, so is there a reference text? Yeah, that's a good question. Like what's, what's a good reference? I think there are a lot of references for this material. Um, I mean, in general, one of the classic references is, is the book by Sarah, A Course in Arithmetic. Um, I think for the general, 
algebraic theory of quadratic forms. There are many sort of textbook sources. For example, there's a book by Lamb um, and one book that I found helpful is by Charlau. Um, but let me also, yeah, so in general, I think they're uh, like for Hassan and Kowski in particular in the, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, uh, I think there was an Arizona Winter School, for example. Uh, so um, virtual Arizona Winter School. Um, and there's some uh, lecture notes by uh, Charlotte Richkan um, on Hassan and Kowski and quadratic forms. I think it's also a good source. Professor Akif, can you please uh, uh, write those uh, sources down in the chat? Uh, sure, I can. Uh, I can try to share and I can try to write. Uh, yeah. So I think some of the classical references are like Sarah's. Uh, I think there are books by Lamb and Charlo. Um, oh, I should also mention there's a book by Milner and Husemuller. Um, and then there's the Arizona Winter School. From 2021. So those are some references I would recommend. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a question I didn't answer earlier. Um, an example about of a problem about quadratic forms which is simpler because we have lots of symmetries? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think, right. So if, if you look at higher degree forms, then you can't, there's not really a simple classification of them even over an algebraically closed field. Um, just because, well, I guess what happens is there are lots of quadratic functions, but also quadratic functions have lots of symmetries and lots of isomorphisms between them. So there's actually only one isomorphism class of uh, quadratic forms over an algebraically closed field. Um, and so, but if you have higher degree forms, somehow there's, there's too many of them. So there's also sort of moduli over an algebraically closed field. And so it's gonna be more complicated, but so quadratic forms, because they all look the same over an algebraically closed field, then somehow if you're trying to classify them or say something interesting about them, um, see whether rational numbers or over some, some field, then that will be closely tied to the, like the arithmetic of that field. Like, you know, for example, questions like, in that field, you know, how you can write things as some squares and um, 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 so forth. And so, so for example, it turns out, I mean, there's a, I guess probably I would say something about this um, later this week or early next week, which is there's a very famous, uh, what well, was a conjecture in the theory of quadratic forms um, uh, called the Milner conjecture. And it relates, uh, well, so first of all, you can sort of, so I guess as I'll explain next time, you can, in classifying the theory of quadratic forms, you can sort of cook up a ring called the Witt ring of a field, which is encoding sort of isomorphisms of quadratic forms, um, isomorphism classes of quadratic forms. Um, and there's the, there was a famous conjecture of Milner that relates this, uh, this, this ring, uh, or rather the associated greater terms of this ring to, um, to on the one hand, milner k theory, which is gonna play some role in this course, uh, and also Galois cohomology, which will, uh, which I guess I will not, Say much about. And so that was proved by uh, Orlov, uh, Vishik, and Vyvodsky. Um, and uh, so, in particular, there's some sort of deep connection between the theory of quadratic forms and like the Galois of the field. Um, I think. So. Yeah, so oh, thanks, um, Freddy, for writing that in the chat about yes, the references. Professor, uh, now you made a comment on uh, higher dimensional forms. So, how are they defined? Are they uh, analogously defined like trilinear uh, forms? Uh, they are something. Uh, or uh, higher dimensional forms? Yeah, I mean, for example, if 
yeah, if you have like a cubic form on a vector space, um, or yeah, so as you said, something like a, I guess a symmetric trilinear form on the vector space, uh, which you can also think of as a homogeneous, you can also think of that as like a homogeneous cubic function on your vector space. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, symmetric means I can change all three in any way I want. I can add the oh, best yes. three on it. Yeah. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so then, I mean, then you'll get into like a problem, like an, an algebraic geometry problem, which is if you're over, if you're over an algebraically closed field, you know, what are like isomorphism classes of cubic, you know, cubic forms? Whereas in in the theory of quadratic forms, there's only one isomorphism classes over over an algebraic closure. So somehow it, it's it's really all about like the field. So uh, I think uh, the uh, problem might be that uh, we will not be able to diagonalize. Yeah. Because if we are Sorry, in diagonal, uh, so the problem uh, I guess might be that uh, oh, there may not be even a matrix representation for the triangular forms. So we may not uh, be able to diagonalize or have a straightforward analog simplicity for any forms. Right. So there's not going to be some analog of diagonalization. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you could, yeah, you could imagine that it comes from some like, yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah. Right, so there's no there's no analog of diagonalization. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a good way of saying it. So the um, the signature of the quadratic form where you have like the ones and then negative ones in the real case, mm -hmm. that, that, that seems to kind of come from the fact that like negative one, that you need to adjoin a root of negative one to get the algebraic closure. So mm -hmm. I was wondering like, it, given any number, it, can you have, it, can you find a field whose algebraic closure is degree that, that number? So you can have like different types of, uh, so you ask about quadratic forms over that field, you'll get an analogous like uh, answer. That's a good question. Uh, but actually the, answer, the, the question has a famous answer. Um, it's theorem of, I believe Arden and Schreier that, I mean, so in general, the only, the only cases in which you can have a field whose algebraic closure is finite degree over it is, uh, is a case of real closed fields. So things that look like the real numbers. Um, another example would be the real algebraic numbers. And so then you get to the algebraic closure by adding a square root of any negative, minus one or any negative number. Um, but yeah, so in general, if, if you have an ordering on your field, um, then, or so if you have a real closed field, but uh, you can specify a real closure of a field by specifying an ordering on your field, um, then you can define a notion of signature with respect to that ordering, yeah. And so in general, there'll be like many different signatures. Um, so for example, if, oops, sorry, if you have the field that's like Q adjoined square root of two, then there are gonna be multiple different orderings because there are two embeddings of Q adjoined square root of two into the real numbers, depending on which square root of two you choose. Um, so if you have a quadratic form over Q adjoined square root of two, you can choose at least two different ways of defining uh, two different choices of signature. Oh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So is the for quadratic form, you said there's a matrix associated to it, a symmetric matrix associated to it, right? So does the diagonal diagonalization of the quadratic form come from the diagonalization of the of the matrix? It's or is not that quite or is yeah, that not I don't quite. know, is that in any way related? Well, so you're not quite diagonalizing the the matrix in the usual sense because you're 
we're diagonalizing a quadratic form. So right, so the question to ask is if you have a change of basis, how does, so right, so if you have a basis, if you have an inner product space, and then if you have a basis, you get a, you know, you get a symmetric matrix. And then the question is how does that, you know, how does that change if you, if you vary the basis? And it's not quite the conjugate of the matrix. It's gonna be like you multiply by A and then you multiply by A transpose on the other side. Um, so I don't know, maybe I should share this. Uh, I mean, so if you have if you have a symmetric matrix A and then you choose a change of base basis matrix B, I guess depending on your conventions, the, the new new quadratic, the new new symmetric matrix is gonna like look like B transpose A times B. And so then the claim is that that's, you know, you can put that in diagonal form. So okay, so that's equivalent to the statement that like a quadratic form can be diagonalized. Yes. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi, I, I just popped right in and I heard that last question. Just practically speaking, if you have the matrix. What does it mean to diagonalize it as a quadratic form? It means you do row and column operations, but each time you do a row operation, you do the corresponding, the same column operation. That's what Akil just said with B, B transpose on either side. That means you are doing the analogous operation. So you can, you can play around with matrices and just try to reduce them to diagonal form where each time you do a row operation, you do exactly the same column operation. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah. Any um, any more questions or comments? Well, if not, I will. Um, but I hope I hope you all go to the the TA session, and well, I'll try to post um, post my notes in Sokoko right away. Um, and otherwise, I will. Yeah, I will see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>